Now, our second short story uh, for this week uh, uh, deals also with realism and a social issue, and this time not necessarily one of uh, uh, infidelity or women's sexuality or things of this nature. Uh, but And to us, maybe it's not quite as taboo a subject. I kind of hope it isn't, anyway. I hope neither of them are. But um, in the 19th century, there was uh, quite a taboo about mental illness. And this is yet another instance of, not coincidentally, I think, a, a, a female writer who is coming forward and saying, I'm going to write in the realist tradition of, I'm going to show you what I see, I'm going to sh- whether you like it or not, whether it makes you uncomfortable or not, I'm going to cover issues dealing with ordinary people in ordinary lives, not knights and, you know, in uh, castles with uh, damsels in distress and things like this. And so um, working in that realism tradition and part of that realism movement is Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. Now, uh, I'm not going to do quite as close a reading here, although there are some passages I want to highlight, um, But and, and I do so at a little bit of a risk because this is a short story that if you're not reading very carefully, you're going to really miss what's going on. You'll get to the end and go, what? Um, as opposed to the previous short story, you get to the end and say, oh? that's not right. People shouldn't be doing that and getting away with it. This is more of a situation where we have um, a a topic, mental illness, that wasn't spoken of very much in the 19th century, um, but was instead kind of swept under the rug, to use a cliche. And uh, we're going to dive into that and see what Gilman's personal experiences with this issue uh, resulted in with respect to this particular short story. Before I do that, though, I'm going to Pull a little, little hat trick on you here. Um, normally, people get to the um, get to a point in with my video lectures of uh, sort of training themselves if they're in a rush to just go to the very end of the very last video and find the quiz and take the quiz and just submit the quiz and do the discussion without listening to the entire lecture. Well, I know I'm not the most engaging person, but you really need to listen to the lecture. So this time I'm going to pull a little. Um, little uh, trick on you. I'm going to tell you right now what the quiz questions are, and uh, you will need to answer them and submit them by Thursday at midnight as we normally do. So people who didn't listen to the full lectures aren't going to find the little quiz nuggets. So consider it a pair of Easter eggs. Question number one is, what did BB and Bobby know go to the store to buy in Charlotte Perkins, I'm sorry, in uh, in uh, Kate Chopin's uh, The Storm. What did they go buy? What, what They went to the store, they were running an errand, they were going to go buy something and bring it back, and they did. What was that item that they bought? The second thing is, what is the narrator in Gilman's Yellow Wallpaper, what is her husband's response at the end of the story? What happens to him when he finally sees her in the room, uh, with the rope around her, um, obviously going mad. He has a particular response. Something happens. What happens to him? What does he do? Or what is done to him, right? Uh, or what happens to him, I should say, uh, at the end. That should be pretty apparent, okay? Answer both of those quiz questions to my Yahoo account by Thursday at midnight. There'll be a discussion, just one discussion prompt this time. I'll give you a choice between which one you want to answer um, for the two short stories that also will be due Thursday at midnight. So this was just designed to kind of switch things up on you so you don't get into that habit of saying, well, I don't have time to listen to the lectures. I'm just going to go to the end of the last... Um, video and get the quiz questions and answer them. All right, so let's dive on into this. Um, First of all, a few things, background things again. Mental illness was uh, something, like we said, that that a lot of families were very embarrassed by or worried by. Um, Very frequently, people in certain parts of the country would care for their own relatives if they could afford it who had mental problems, and they would put them in an attic or in a secure part of the house, usually up high above everybody, like a second floor or something like that. Or, or what. So at the beginning of this short story, you kind of think, oh, well, the narrator's telling the story, and um, gee, maybe they're just going to go out for it. She's not feeling well. Her husband, of course, John, is a physician, uh, and she has another physician. And, um, and um, they've been prescribing for her the rest cure because... She's not feeling well. She's not emotionally, mentally, she's not doing well. 
Um, she's just had a baby. You and I and anybody else with half a brain in 2020 look at this and say, oh, this woman is suffering from postpartum depression. Oh, number one, that's not terribly uncommon. Number two, um, it's not anything to stigmatize anybody about. It's something that you want to make sure you help someone with. This is this happens to a lot of women. They go through this, and it is nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. It's just, I won't say it's, I not want to say it's normal or natural, because I'm sure, being a man, I wouldn't know. Um, it's not fun to go through, but it's not something that, you know, oh my gosh, we have to lock her away forever, right? We need to we need to help and reach out to people and their treatments and things that people can do today. It's still very difficult, even with treatments and things, but it's not something we would lock someone in an attic for. So, But in, in that day and age, people really didn't know much about it at all. Gilman herself, after giving birth, suffered through this. And she says this very candidly in other places outside of the short story that she went and sought uh, treatment with Dr. Weir Mitchell, that's him on the right there, um, who prescribed for her the same thing that was prescribed for this narrator, which is the rest cure. Okay, so it's 2020. We look back. It's easy to kind of say, oh my gosh, how stupid were people back in the day. But hey, I'm sure our grandchildren will say that about us. But you got to admit that to tell somebody who's going through deep depression that what they really need to do is completely isolate themselves and shut themselves off from the world and especially don't do the things that you really enjoy in life and um, not be around family other than just very infrequently and just lie down in a bed and just sleep all day and all night. Jeez, that cannot be. I mean, you and I look at that and say, oh, that is a disaster waiting to happen. That's not what this lady needs. The lady needs to be able to talk to somebody and she needs therapy. And I know they didn't have pharmaceuticals back then very much. But the last thing you want to do is just say, hey, go live in this closet and nobody's going to and you're going to be it's like solitary confinement they gave this lady that's what the real dr weir mitchell prescribed and it was a disaster for charlotte perkins gilman and she was so upset about it after she had received terrible treatment that she wrote this short story in response frankly and published it and sent him a copy and it was years later that Mitchell eventually privately admitted that, yeah, yeah it's probably not a great treatment. I'm not going to do that anymore with any other women who come to see me. Um, yeah, duh. Um, so, you know, that's the outcome of this is, is what happens. What we have here, though, is a narrator who, at the beginning of the story, you really do believe, most people do when they read it the first time, that you really do believe that oh, they're just getting away from their hectic life. She needs some rest. Uh, she's had a tough time, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the beginning of the story, we see a narrator and hear the voice of a narrator who seems to be perfectly rational. And you say, well, she doesn't seem terribly, she seems a little maybe down a bit, but she doesn't seem crazy. Um, and, um, you know, it, this was something that, that, that doesn't, catch us off, off guard. However, there are a few nuggets in the story that if you read them carefully, you begin to say, hmm. So for example, one of the things that she really loves to do is to write. And she's a very creative person. Even as a child, you hear her talking about the fact that as a child, I had a great imagination and she liked to write. Well, and this is very autobiographical. This is Gilman. I don't think Gilman was locked up in a room like this and she didn't actually lose it with a bunch of wallpaper. I don't think that's the case, but this is somewhat autobiographical because of course, Gilman is an author. Gilman is a very creative person. She likes to write. Um, and uh, oh, by the way, the voice is that of the narrator we're reading it. She was expressly forbidden to write anything. How the heck did we get this story then? If she didn't violate what she was told not to do, right? Uh, I didn't think about that. Some people were like, oh yeah, that's right. She must have disobeyed the doctor's orders and her husband, because otherwise we wouldn't have the text, would we? Um, because it's in first person. It's not third person. She wrote, and, and so she, you know, the, the, the prescribed treatment for her did everything it could to just completely squash what made her happy. Writing made her happy. Now, now, by the way, we all know how therapeutic writing about traumatic experiences and difficulties can be. And yet this doctor totally cut that off. Her husband totally cuts that off. It's, you don't do anything. You don't go anywhere. You stay in this room. You sleep all day. And no, you can't do the thing that you love the most, which is to write. 
and we want to get rid of your imagination. We want to get rid of all your creativity. The one thing that probably could have made her better, right? Um, so um, how long is it in the short story before you realize something is not right here? I, For me, very first opening of the, uh, of the story almost, right? When she says... Um, John laughs at me. That's her husband. John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. Um, what, what, does one expect to be laughed at by one's spouse? Especially because remember what she's saying is, well, why do we need to go here? Why, why do we need to stay here? Why should we go that? I don't really want to do that. And he laughs at her. It's a dismissive laugh. And she says, well, one expects that in a, in a marriage. I don't. You shouldn't. Right. I mean, in other words, there, there's reason even early on to, to call into question her husband's treatment of her. Not that he's mean and, and abusive intentionally, but he's very, and I hate to use it because it's overused, paternalistic towards her, obviously. John is practical in the extreme. He has no patience with faith, an intense horror of superstition, and he scoffs openly at any talk of things not to be felt and seen and put down in figures. He's a physician. He's a man of science and medicine. I don't believe in this, that, and the other. Don't talk to me about feelings. Talk to me about chemistry and physics and biology. Feeling schmealings. That's the way he approaches things. Well, okay, so he sees his patients as lab animals to be experimented on, maybe? I, I, I don't know. Everybody knows that anybody in healthcare, you're dealing with what? Human beings? Huh? Yeah? Who have emotions and feelings and all kinds of things about them. Every good medical practitioner takes in to account the entire person that you're treating. And that, I think, is one of Gilman's critiques in the short story, that medicine, as it was being practiced at the end of the 19th century, was too clinical, too scientific, and did not take into account real human beings and their experiences. It didn't help, I think, being a woman, that almost everybody in the medical profession was male and didn't understand anything about women's issues and women's health issues. They really didn't. They didn't understand it at all. They certainly didn't take into account, like I said, the human factor of treating patients. Um, and so there's a real big criticism right off the bat with that. Um, she says, perhaps that's why I don't get, get well faster. Maybe I just because I'm just, I'm just a bad wife. She's very, very down on herself in many regards. And she says her brother's also a physician. And she said, personally, I disagree with her ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. I did write for a while in spite of them, but it does exhaust me a good deal having to be so sly about it. In other words, there's nothing wrong with writing. I actually enjoy it. What's exhausting is the fact that I can't let them know I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> that's what's infuriating. So it, did you also notice that at night, he comes and visits her. And look at the way he speaks to her. He almost treat, he speaks to her like she's a little girl. And it's very odd that in the daytime, she's a patient and an adult. At nighttime, he goes up there, lights out. They share a bed together. You do the math. But he also kind of treats her like she's a little girl. It's kind of, it's a really creepy kind of thing. He says something to the effect of, she will be as sick as she wants to be, poor little thing. It's like, ew, right? I mean, I don't talk to my wife like she's 11. It's a we it's, it's just weird. Um, and he still evidently has a sexual interest in her. Um, or at least I think that's what she's hinting at. But outside of that, it's not an, a, a real adult relationship that they seem to have. Now, we have other people living in the house. Of course, they have a, a caretaker, and we have John's sister. And what's interesting is that John's sister and also the nanny, the caretaker, have really taken over all of what the regular duties would be of a normal middle-class wife. Now, let's go back, and it's kind of an interesting history thing. Most people who were in professions, whether they were lawyers or dentists or doctors or what have you, frequently they operated their businesses, their practices out of their home. Not always, but they frequently did, um, unless it was a really big practice, right, where they had a downtown office and things like that. But a lot of, especially small town or mid-sized town people, ran their businesses out of their homes. And it was considered, especially if you were a professional, um, 
kind of normal for the the man who was a doctor to employ his wife who largely was the business manager that that happened with my uh, my uncle and aunt for example back in the day um, they were both in Fulton Missouri they lived in Fulton Missouri and it's a small town and he was the physician and she was the business manager for the practice um, and if it was very successful that would happen but at the very least even if a doctor didn't need that a hundred years ago um, suffice it to say that the, running the household was a big enough responsibility for most women of middle class means that they were a pretty busy bunch. Even with servants, you were pretty busy. If you had a couple of kids and a, you know pretty good standing in the community, it was expected that you would be involved in your church and charitable organizations and social obligations and these kinds of things. I mean, women did a lot of things that they didn't get paid for, but that kept communities together and families together. And if you were a family of some means, not wealthy, but some means, you might have somebody who helped with the housework, but you managed the household affairs, which was a lot of work. Even if you didn't do all the laundry and cooking yourself, which would have been a lot of work, even if you were overseeing all that, it could be quite a bit of a day, right? I mean, you're putting in 12, 14 hour days doing that. This was all considered, at least in the 19th century, what was called part of the domestic sphere of influence for women, right? Middle class educated women of some means, not wealthy. Uh, people spoke of the idea that they had a sphere of influence, that they were in charge of the house, of the family, of domestic concerns, that men would go out and make the money and women would deal with all of the domestic affairs, General, generally speaking, the education and rearing of the children, although men had some input on that. It, the primary obligation fell to the women running the household, which today, I mean, geez, folks, we go pick up our laundry and we pick up dinner and we have a considerably greater amount of leisure time. The, there's just things like dishwashers and washing machines and refrigerators make our lives way, way easier. But I mean, doing laundry was alone was just a horrific chore. I mean, it was an all day thing. It's usually done on Mondays. And so Monday had the nickname Blue Monday because it was like, Ugh, who wants to, you know, bummer. Um, and just cooking and cleaning and all those kinds of things was just a huge undertaking, especially if you have a large house and a fairly large family, even with servants. So, but, but, it, there was a division of labor there. Men did their thing. Women did their thing. Men had their practice or their offices and their role, and women ran the households. Um, but in this case, because of this, that's been taken from her. And, and in the 19th century, especially middle-class women, that was their identity. That was their role. That was their raison d'etre, as you would say, their reason for being is raising children and running a household and, and being a prominent member of the community. And this woman has that taken away from her because of this. So her sister-in-law and the nanny are all doing the childcare and running the household and she's just doing nothing. So she feels like she doesn't have purpose. And so that's, how good is that for somebody who's depressed, right? To not feel like you have any purpose, to have a lot of time on your hands and isolated and no sense of purpose. So that's what's going on here throughout. Now, Gradually, as you can tell, hopefully your eyes get open. You say, mm, I don't think our narrator is all that reliable. I think our narrator is really going through some problems here. Because at first she thinks this room with the rings and the bars on the wall, she thinks, oh, this was a nursery. These kids, oh, they're so they're so rowdy. You got to keep them locked in. You got to keep them locked down. Why? They even got on the bed and tried to turn it over and stuff. So, of course, you got to nail the bed down. Um, and there are rings on the walls and ropes and bars on the window. This is, you know, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a nursery <laughs> with bars on the windows. But that's, you know, what she's kind of, maybe they've told her that. I don't know. They rented this house special because it had a room like that. They rented this house special because they were going to lock her up in the third floor, up in the attic, in the loft, because they were worried about her because she is you know, mentally unstable, according to... Well, at the beginning of the story, it hardly seems that her behavior warrants that degree of, of fear and paranoia. Certainly by the end, we see that. If at the beginning of the story, we didn't have a woman who was crazy, certainly by the end, she's crazy. But guess what made her crazy? The treatment. That's what made her crazy. She didn't need to be in a place like that, but we certainly see that towards towards the end. Um, uh, it, it goes on a bit and you begin to see that she begins fixating on the wallpaper and she starts seeing things in the wallpaper and she even sees a woman in the wallpaper who's trying to get out. Who is that? 
well, most people speculate and say it's the narrator's own sort of other personality, her alter ego. And the, 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 the distinction between the narrator and the woman in the wallpaper totally breaks down, totally blurs, and she becomes the woman in the wallpaper towards the end of, of the thing. But even then, you should be aware as this process is ongoing, <coughs> excuse me, that, that certain things that the narrator's not noticing that we ought to notice. For example, she says, you know what? Everywhere I go, I smell that wallpaper. It's got a peculiar smell. And I just smell it. I turn my head and I smell it. And, uh, you know, I stand up real quick or sit down real quick and I smell it. And it's like everywhere that, that smell is following me. Then we notice that there's also this smooch or smudge that goes around the room near like the, the baseboard, right? Down, down lower. Um, and you're thinking, what's going on? That Well, at the end, we realize what's going on. The reason that she's smelling the wallpaper smell is because she's going around the room, you know, rubbing up against the wallpaper, and it's getting in her hair, it's getting in her clothing. You know, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but, you know, if, if you've got five people in a room and, and, and you're the only one who smells someone stinky, it, it, it could be you, right? The reason she smells the wallpaper is because it's on her clothing and in her hair, right? I turn my hair real, my head real quick and I smell it. Yeah, duh, because it's like on you. Um, why is it on her? Because she's been going around in circles around the room, right? Like on four, uh, on all fours, smudging up against the wall because she's going crazy. Um, and so we see that towards the end there. It's kind of, even when I go for a ride, I turn my head suddenly and surprise, there is the smell. Well, yeah, it's you. It's in your hair. It's because you've been smudging up against the wall all day. Um, I'm not trying to take it too lightly, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting thing. Hopefully by the time you get towards the end, you're going, uh, yeah, this, this lady ain't living in a nursery and something's really wrong with her. But the point I think that she's trying to get across to everybody is something needs to be done. She's trying to, like a good realist would give you the raw story without any morals, without any, oh, ever happily lived ever after. And she's trying to delve into a topic that at that time people were very uncomfortable with. We still are, but not as bad as I think probably 120 years ago. It was amazingly how people, no one talked about it. Um, and they were very embarrassed by it if a family member had, had mental health issues. And the, uh, so much so that they just actually made them into non-people. Uh, and, and so very severe. And she's trying to shed some light on this and say, D don't look away. Look at this. Good literature should reveal society and people as they are and not try to fancy them up or, or polish them up as the way they should be. Um, and so she's dealing with that. She's dealing with, I think, a very serious question of women's health issues and the fact that there was just so little done for women and so little understood by women. Um, I'd love to tell the story because it's an interesting one. You know, the word hysteria comes from the same word that we get the word hysterectomy from. And when Freud in the early 20th century went to a conference, I think it was in Vienna, I can't recall, <clears throat> and described men as suffering men and women, both suffering from hysteria, people laughed because they said, well, men can't suffer from hysteria. Men don't have uteruses um, because they really did think that certain mental disorders stemmed from malfunctions of female organs, which is just a weird idea to us. But that was the state of sort of primitive state of psychology and the mental health industry and, and physical health industry as well, and how little people understood women and their bodies and biology and all this kind of stuff. Remember that that um, most people involved for, for most of human history in childbirth were not men or doctors. They were doulas. They were um, nurse midwives, uh, midwives of some sort, right? So, so even all of that was something that most physician, male physicians didn't know an awful lot about. So I think she's trying to shed light on two issues, mental health and women's health in general. And she's trying to use fiction and, and literature to try to do that. So in that vein, she's very, very much part of the realist movement who wants to shine light on social issues. Is, does, the, does the author have a point of view? Is there a, certainly at least a very strong implicit thing that she wants you to think or, or, or believe? Yes. But the difference between this and a romantic writer is that a romantic writer would just flat out at the end tell you what she thought. 
um, and what you ought to think about the issue. And here, at least Gilman wants to hold back and just present you with something and let you come to your own conclusions about it. Eh, it may be rigged, but at least there's a pretense there of objectivity. Naturally, um, it is the physician husband who seems to lose it at the end when he faints. Um, and just falls over and she says, now, why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. So there's John passed out on the floor and here's, um, Jane. We find out that that's her name. She talks, she, when she's the woman in the wallpaper, she refers to the narrator as Jane. So we got John and Jane, very generic names, for example. She goes, um, you know, I've, I've got out of the wallpaper at last. And so she, he, passes out because she's become the woman in the wallpaper and she's deranged and he gets into the room and she's like continues to go round and round and round the room stepping over him every time on all fours um it's quite a quite an interesting uh, visual there okay so two quiz questions buried earlier on in this video uh you need to go back and watch the whole video both of them and uh, make sure you get those turned in at the end of the day or that is midnight on thursday